Um, good evening and a very happy new year to all of you who are logged in to our first e-lecture of this year, 2014. Uh, we hope this marks the beginning of an uh, interesting, exciting, and vibrant series of e-lectures in radiology. Um, the topic for today is multi-detector CT of acute bowel pathologies. This is uh, taken from a talk that I had given once before in Mumbai at one of the conferences. But the context, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background for those of you who are um, not familiar with our organization. The uh, scenario in which these cases are acquired uh, we are a group of emergency teleradiologists, and so we are reporting emergency scans within 30 minutes to hospitals in any many parts of the world. Uh, we have used the principle of economy of scale, which is by having a radiologist reporting for multiple hospitals. And we use the day-to-night, the night-to-day model, which allows us to report for countries in diametrically opposite parts of the world and support their night shift operations. Uh, and that has sometimes been called the night hawk model. Uh, we've been uh, figured in the literature in several publications, and uh, this particular editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine below is uh, one of the um, validations of the international teleradiology model. I would encourage those of you who are interested in doing teleradiology to go through it. So the, uh, the the value that the emergency teleradiologist provides is that uh, you know we are specialized generalists. We focus on acute pathologies. Uh, we are exposed to a wide spectrum of acute disease and a wide spectrum of modalities. Where we cover a large catchment area of hospitals in different parts of the world, and so we see many different kinds of uh, uh, disease, from infections to tumors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we see pretty much every type of uh, exam, but majority of our cases tend to be body CTs and uh, CTs of the head and spine. And the interesting thing about it is that we get immediate follow-up on positives by speaking with the referring ER physicians. Uh, and these are some of the countries for which we provide teleradiology coverage. Uh, the, the material that we gather in the course of our clinical practice is shared with all of you on the RADGURU website. I encourage all of you to visit it and send us your feedback. And uh, as you are now participating in an e-lecture, we, apart from that, we also have our on-site um, auditorium where we conduct continuing education on a regular basis. So uh, our mission is to share the learnings that we have gained over the past 12 years of our existence with, with everyone uh, using technology as well as uh, high-quality infrastructure. So without further ado, I'll move into the topic, which is uh, basically CT of the acute abdomen, and I'm going to be covering a number of conditions. I'm not sure if it will be possible to do justice to all of them today, so we may end up splitting this into two talks. Uh, but the most important con condition I wanted to spend some time on is that of bowel perforation. And the important thing about bowel perforation is, of course, that it is or can be a life-threatening situation, and this is what uh, we what is termed as a critical value uh, diagnosis. In other words, if one sees signs of bowel perforation, uh, the, the, it, there is a requirement for immediate communication with the treating physician or surgeon that allows for immediate care of the patient because uh, these patients can become uh, septic very fast. The hallmark of bowel perforation that we see on CT scan is, of course, uh, the presence of free air. And when we see it in volumes such as this, where it's covering half of the abdomen, it's an easy diagnosis to make. Um, uh, those of you who are familiar with the sign will notice there's a false form ligament that is poking into the air, large air pocket. But this is something that, you know, first-year residents will be able to diagnose. But the challenge is, of course, to pick it up in the earlier stages and pick up subtler variants of perforation. And here is a manifestation of perforation. In fact, several of them on the same image. Uh, this is free air under the diaphragm. This is a collection of extravasated oral contrast with an air fluid level. 
uh, along the surface of the liver. This is oral contrast that is tracked along the surface of the spleen. This is some oral contrast within the gastrosthenic ligament and loculi of free intraperitoneal air. And most subtle of all is this one air loculus in the porta hepatis, which when seen in the context of all these other collections is probably not very significant, but on the rare occasion where that is the only manifestation of perforation that exists, picking up this finding is can be of extreme importance. So always remember to look in the porta hepatis at a narrow window for very, very subtle loculations of free air that can help make a diagnosis of, of perforation of the duodenum. Uh, as we can see, peptic ulcer disease is a major cause, but necrotic and ulcerated malignancies are also an equally important cause of bowel perforation. The other thing is to remember that the free air loculi can sometimes point us to the site of pathology. So if we see free air clustered in a, around a particular bowel loop, then that's the bowel loop that is most likely to be the site of perforation, and that's the one that needs to be examined more carefully. Here's another example where there are loculi of free air along the uh, surface of the spleen beneath the left diaphragm. And again, that little insidious loculus of free air uh, sitting in the fissure for the ligamentum venosum at the porta hepatis. More patterns of perforation, a small collection of oral contrast along the surface of the stomach. Uh, along with air loculi that are extra luminal. Always look at CTs of the abdomen on wide windows because those are absolutely critical to be able to diagnose small loculi of free air. Uh, this would be very difficult to pick up on normal soft tissue windows. Uh, so we're essentially looking for air on the outside of the bowel wall. This is, of course, the stomach uh, as a sign of bowel perforation. We are also looking for subtler evidence of mesenteric and peritoneal inflammation in the form of fat stranding and thickening of the bowel wall. These are additional secondary supportive features of bowel inflammation. So in addition to looking for extraluminal air and contrast collections, it's also important to look for dirty fat. And again, the importance of using wide windows cannot be overemphasized. Multiple collections of extraluminal air and contrast in a patient with a large perforation. You can see air uh, and contrast collections all around the liver and in the paracolic gutters. Uh, the reason for showing these two images is because uh, to highlight the importance of using the wider windows, this could very well be mistaken for air at the lung base, but in fact, it is uh, free air under the diaphragm, and that is something that only using a wider window would allow us to determine. Uh, contrast collection, again, at the surface of the liver, or tracking along the gastrohepatic ligament, tracking around the spleen. So always look for uh, a rim of high density around the spleen as an indication for oral contrast extravasation. And these are, again, large collections of extraluminal air, which would be missed on normal narrow window CT. So very, very important to always look at the bone and lung windows on CT scans of the abdomen. Uh, some of the typical locations for free air are in the subhepatic space, anterior subhepatic space, posterior subhepatic space, also known as Morrison's pouch, or in the subdiaphragmatic area uh, under the liver, against the liver. The uh, other thing to remember about free air is that different pathologies are associated with different quantities of free air. Uh, this is a patient with a perforated sigmoid diverticulitis, and we can see multiple loculi of free air at the peritoneal surface here, uh, which uh, is typical in patients with uh, perforations of large structures such as the colon, whereas in Perforated appendicitis, the loculi of free air tend to be few and small, as we see here uh, surrounding the appendix, uh, commensurate to the fact that the appendix is a small structure with a small amount of intraluminal air. So uh, use free air as an indicator, as a sign, as a guide uh, 
and as a, an arrow to point you to the diagnosis. Here's an interesting article from clinical imaging some years ago where we see that um, the what is called the falciform ligament sign where the free air tracks along the falciform ligament is uh, a, a common uh, indicator of proximal or upper GI perforations whereas uh, and we can see here in the article whereas with distal GI perforations the, the signs that we see more commonly are bowel wall thickening and fat stranding uh, and smaller pockets of extraluminal air, multiple pockets. So depending on where we see the free air, we can pretty much say that the, prox the, uh, the perforation is proximal or distal free air surrounding the liver recesses tends to be associated with proximal or upper GI perforations, whereas free air uh, scattered throughout the ab abdomen or in the lower abdomen tends to be more associated with distal GI perforations. Moving on to the entity of bowel obstruction. The commonest cause for bowel obstruction is, of course, adhesions, which typically means that we don't see very much. It's generally a diagnosis of exclusion on CT. When we see a bowel obstruction without an obvious cause, then the, by inference, the adhesions are the cause. But we must always first exclude a cause in the form of a mass, a hernia, a stricture, or a volvulus, which are the less common causes of bowel obstruction. But our role as radiologists in bowel obstruction is not complete until we have done all of these five things that are listed here. First thing is, of course, to make the diagnosis, which is based on detecting air fluid levels and on confirming that the caliber of the dilated bowel loops uh, exceeds the normal. So in the case of small bowel, we take 2.5 or 3 centimeters, uh, depending on your preference, and the three is uh, a more specific uh, cutoff, but um, there'll be some overlap if you take 2.5. Uh, the site of transition is important to determine for the surgeon because that allows them to plan their incision when lysing the adhesions. Uh, and a very helpful sign in that regard is what's called a small bowel feces sign, which I will show you in a moment. The grade of obstruction is de determined by comparing the caliber of the bowel proximal to the obstruction to that of the bowel distal to the obstruction and also seeing if any oral contrast gets through the, the obstructed segment. Uh, of course, the cause of obstruction in the form of mass hernia or volvulus. And finally, the presence of complications in the form of bowel wall ischemia or perforation. And no uh, report is complete in, in the setting of, small, of, of bowel obstruction without commenting on the presence or absence of this finding. So uh, the, the, the nuts and bolts or the basics of a small bowel obstruction is to determine that there are air fluid levels in the bowel which make the diagnosis of small bowel obstruction. Uh, once we have made that determination, we go uh, further and try and find the site of transition. Uh, and for that, oftentimes we need to resort to a combination of axial imaging as well as reformats uh, because with small bowel loops, it's often hard uh, to say exactly where the transition is. And it takes time and effort and a lot of scrolling uh, using your uh, PAX console. In fact, in the old days when we read uh, scans on films, uh, I find it hard to believe that people were able to make this diagnosis of a site of transition because you had to go serially from one image to the other instead of being able to scroll. So I think that would have been extremely difficult back in the old days. Uh, the grade of obstruction, as we said, is determined by the caliber of the distal bowel loops relative to the proximal. So in this case, the distal bowel loop is com nearly completely collapsed, and so this is a, for a high-grade obstruction, as opposed to this situation where the distal bowel is not fully collapsed and also contrast is seen within the distal bowel as well as in the proximal bowel, which indicates that it is a partial small bowel obstruction. The small bowel CC sign is a very helpful sign to um, make the assessment of where the site of transition is. And essentially what it is, is that we see uh, fecal-like material within the small bowel immediately proximal to the site of the obstruction. So if you have a, a, an obstructed bowel, look for the uh, segment of bowel that looks like it contains stool in it, and that will be uh, just proximal to the site where the obstruction is. This is a very helpful sign uh, for uh, localizing the site of transition. So for those postgraduates who are tuned in, here's a 
uh, a quiz case and um, I would like to, uh, you can type in your answers. What, what is the, the diagnosis in this 30 year old male with right lower quadrant pain? And um, I'm looking for someone to type an answer into the box. So here we see there is uh, seg multiple segments of dilated bowel. in the uh, throughout the abdomen and there is a segment of bowel that looks somewhat thickened and there is a appearance of a bowel within bowel so this is a case of an ileocolic interception and here is a very nice example of what we call the small bowel feces sign there is a dilated loop of bowel immediately proximal to the obstructed segment that contains fecal-like material and points like an arrow directly to the site of transition. So uh, this is an uh, ileocolic interception which can be um, confirmed by the presence of the small bowel CC sign uh, immediately proximal to it. Uh, colonic obstructions tend to be more commonly related to tumors and what we look for is dilated colon, which abruptly terminates at a site of transition, where we see a shouldering, which is the uh, proximal extent of the tumor. Uh, and the common, most common malignancy responsible for this is, of course, colorectal carcinoma, uh, the vast majority of which occur in the region of the rectum and sigmoid colon. Uh, the remaining 25% are through the rest of the bowel. Uh, it's the most common cause of large bowel obstruction is primary colon cancer and diverticular disease is a small major minority. If you see pericolonic lymph nodes in association with an intraluminal mass, then that is highly suspicious for a tumor of the bowel. So here we have a 48-year-old male who has presented with abdominal pain, nausea, and blood in the stools. Can anyone uh, make the see the diagnosis here? Please feel free to type in your responses. So we see a loop of colon here, multiple loops of small bowel, and this is the sigmoid colon. And there is a constricted segment of sigmoid colon. There is this uh, apple core lesion of the sigmoid colon, or a napkin ring lesion, also uh, the, both uh, terms are used, which is causing narrowing of the lumen, as well as uh, narrowing of the external cirrhosal surface. So uh, there is a stricture, a malignant stricture, and we can see the typical shadowing that is, uh, sorry, shouldering that is the characteristic of a malignant neoplasm of the colon, which is partially obstructing in this case. A patient with left lower quadrant abdominal pain this is a much older patient. Uh, typically in older patients, the diagnosis is more difficult uh, because they tend to have many incidental findings. Uh, they tend to have diverticular disease. Uh, they don't have as much fat typically, and there is a lot of concomitant pathology. But here we can see again that there is a shouldering neoplasm in the sigmoid, rectosigmoid colon. Uh, somewhat hard to make out on the axial images because of the um, overlap artifact, uh, but this is where the reformats are particularly helpful. So uh, in the setting of colonic obstruction, remember that uh, the malignancy is the most likely cause and look carefully for the uh, site of transition and for the uh, shouldering, which tells you that the cause of the obstruction is malignant. The other cause for uh, bowel obstruction, 
we have a raised hand, Dr. Jairipa. Um, go ahead, Dr. Jairipa. Robin, I'm not able to see the responses or hear the questions, so maybe I'm not seeing all the chat windows. It's uh, sent to everyone so that I can also see it. If you send it only to Robin, then uh, I don't get the uh, I don't have the ability to see it. So please uh, feel free to, uh, to, uh, to to send your comments and responses and questions to everyone. Um, so sterile colitis is a specific entity where the colon becomes inflamed as a result of being uh, impacted by a, a fecal bolus. So it's a form of fecal impaction in which uh, the rectal wall or the wall of the rectal sigmoid colon becomes stretched uh, because of the presence of a large amount of hard stool. And uh, from being stretched, it becomes inflamed, abraded, and uh, the patient develops a colitis. And that is what is called stercoral colitis. So the, the hallmark of stercoral colitis is that there is uh, there's a fecal impaction uh, causing it. So, um, you know, th in this case, it would not be the, the situation because, uh, you know, there isn't sufficient fecal material to be causing fecal impaction. Uh, but uh, but in stercoral colitis, the primary finding is the fecal impaction, and the colitis is is an is is a secondary. So uh, that's uh, the appearance would be slightly different in the case of a stercoral colitis as opposed to um, uh, an obstructing tumor. So moving on to uh, incarcerated hernias with uh, small bowel obstruction. Here is an example. We have a small bowel obstruction, and when we trace the bowel down, we find the site of transition is at the uh, neck of this large left inguinous scrotal hernia, and that's right where the, the constriction is taking place. So, in the in, in the setting of uh, bowel obstruction, always remember to examine the hernia orifices, uh, which are the usual suspects, and uh, the, the commonest among those are, of course, the inguinal canals. So, in 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 males, particularly in females, look a little more laterally at the femoral rings, uh, but the inguinal canal is. Uh, by far and above the most common cause and site for uh, obstructed hernias. So always start your search by looking at the, um, the inguinal rings, inguinal canals, and this is a patient with a, a strangulated right inguinal hernia uh, with a high-grade small bowel obstruction. So we the first uh, note the presence of the small bowel obstruction, then our eyes go to the inguinal canal, and we see uh, loops of bowel which are edematous, constricted and there is a small amount of fluid in the hernia sac and those are the signs of uh, incarceration or obstruction. Um, if you start to see pneumatosis um, or free air outside of the bowel, of course, that indication that the bowel is infarcted uh, secondary to strangulation. Uh, this is a ventral hernia which has become incarcerated and strangulated and you can see that there is a lot of edema of the bowel and congestion of the mesenteric vessels that have herniated. So uh, here is a, a quiz for uh, the postgraduates in the group, um, or anyone who should choose to, who should uh, be uh, wish to respond. Uh, the patient who has a small bowel obstruction, and on the image on the top left, and the diagnosis in the image on the bottom right. Uh, which is uh, the and does this is anyone who can make this diagnosis? It's difficult when you have only two images. Definitely, it's much easier when you have the entire scan to scroll through. But if we see here um, the the the. The, one of the principles of radiology is to, oh, excellent, uh, Vandana has correctly made the diagnosis. Dr. Vandana Marwa has correctly diagnosed the obturator hernia, which is this little soft tissue density here in the right obturator uh, fossa. Uh, this is the obturator foramen, as we know, um, and you're seeing a small segment of bowel that has herniated through. This is a hernia that is commonly seen in elderly females with lax pelvic walls. It's not something you're going to see in young athletic males. But in the setting of an elderly female patient with a small bowel obstruction, you're not able to find the cause. Always remember to look at the obturator canals 
because this is a very insidious hernia. At first glance, it looks like it could be a lymph node or um, you know, neurofibroma or something incidental, but in fact, this is a loop of bowel that is incarcerated within this obturator hernia. So uh, this is the classic location and appearance and demography of an obturator hernia. So please remember to uh, think of this in your differential for obstruction. Here's another type of hernia which commonly gets strangulated or obstructed. And I'm sure all of you are aware of the name of this hernia. It's um, a characteristic location at the semilunar line along the lateral margin of the rectus sheath, uh, which is the, you see here. Uh, and as um, I just mentioned, it is one that is highly susceptible to become strangulated or incarcerated, as in this case, and result in a small bowel obstruction. So uh, this is a Spigelian hernia. And bonus question for those of you who have ever seen something like this, not something you see very often, uh, what type of hernia is this? Again, it's difficult on the one single coronal image that I've provided, but there's a hint, there's a clue. This is um, one of the rarest forms of hernia there is. I've only seen it once or twice in the course of last uh, many years that I've been practicing radiology. And it's the sort of thing that you would submit for a case report. Anyone? So this is the cecum that has entered this right inguinal hernia. And usually when the cecum goes somewhere, what goes along with it? Structure that is intimately connected with it, which is the appendix. You see the appendix here, in fact, a little appendicular in its lumen. So this is the appendix that is within this inguinal hernia, and there's a particular name for this kind of hernia. Anybody familiar with it? And that's what it's called. It's uh, named presumably after the surgeon who first described it. It's a very, very rare hernia. It's called the amyand hernia, and it's a hernia containing the appendix. And of course, uh, if the appendix becomes inflamed, then this can uh, mimic a strangulated hernia when in fact it is acute appendicitis within a herniated the appendix, the herniated appendix within an inguinal hernia as opposed to strangulation of the hernia itself. Uh, moving on to the next condition, which is volvulus. Uh, and this is another entity that's responsible for small bowel obstruction, particularly high-grade obstruction. Uh, this is a mesenteric volvulus. And as uh, many of us would be familiar with this appearance, this is a so-called world sign, which is the appearance of bowel twisted around the mesenteric vessels. Uh, and the afferent and the efferent loops go into this kind of dance around the mesentery. Um, and it's named after the uh, meteorological term, which is the whirlpool. Uh, and this is supposed to resemble the appearance of a whirlpool. So the, the thing to remember is that not all whirls are necessarily associated with volvulus. Whirl mesentery is a sign of mesenteric twist, but can be seen as an incidental finding in um, many, many uh, people. We, we see this fairly commonly on the routine scans done for other indications. And the only time it is of significance is when it is associated with a small bowel obstruction and it forms the epicenter of the small bowel obstruction. So this is not something that we should overcall. Uh, this is something that needs to be viewed in context of a small bowel obstruction. When we see uh, a small bowel obstruction where the loops are sent, focused around this kind of world mesentery, then the, the, the diagnosis of volvulus is something we must consider. Uh, and this is only to, just to show that the distal small bowel loops are completely collapsed. So this is clearly a high-grade obstruction. Uh, the other term that we use in, in respect to obstruction is closed loop, where we see 
a single long loop of bowel that's dilated and obstructed, and um, uh, the bowel proximal and distal to it is non-dilated, uh, then that's the hallmark of a closed loop obstruction of which one of the common causes is volvulus. Uh, furthermore, the degree of tightness of the whirl predicts the degree of rotation. So this is something to consider. The tighter the twist, the more severe the, the volvulus. Uh, and one predisposing cause is high fiber diets and pregnancy. A different kind of volvulus here we see uh, as we're scanning through this abdominal CT, we start to see this very abnormal looking loop of bowel in the epigastrium. Uh, it's interposed between the liver and the stomach, which is not somewhere we'd expect to see bowel normally, and it contains stool. Uh, and as we come down and as we look at the reformats, we see that it's it's clearly an abnormal <coughs> excuse me segment. And this is um, this is a, a, an example of of a volvulus. Uh, this is the so-called coffee bean sign that we descri that is described for sigmoid volvulus, and that's why it's called what it is. What it is called, uh, this loop of bowel resembles very much this coffee bean, uh, and the the, uh, the plain film uh, literature talks about how uh, the sigmoid volvulus points upwards into the right and the cecal volvulus points upwards into the left. There's some degree of overlap, but CT is truth and the CT will always bring us to the right diagnosis. So in this case, we look for the dilated loop of colon and the twist or the beak, which indicates to us that the colon is twisted or that there is a volvulus. Um, when we don't see the cecum in the right lower quadrant, then the, what we must think about is the possibility of a cecal volvulus in a patient with acute abdomen. And that is the uh, typical appearance where the loop of bowel is uh, displaced to the left upper quadrant and there is a, a constricted segment uh, and the distal colon is completely decompressed. And this has sometimes been referred to as the bird's beak sign. Uh, and this picture of the seagull will highlight it further. Further additional examples of cecal volvulus, the characteristic absent cecum in the right lower quadrant, the dilated loop of bowel in the left mid-abdomen, and of course the coronal reformats show it very nicely in that there is complete reversal of the normal anatomy and the beak sign with the twist of the mesentery resulting in the cecal volvulus. Most of these will be associated with a small bowel obstruction as well because of the fact that the ileocecal valve gets twisted on itself and the uh, distal small bowel is also obstructed. Now, one of the pitfalls of this condition is what is called a cecal bascule, where the uh, the cecum is anatomically redundant and folded upon itself without an actual twist or torsion. And it occurs in those patients where there is redundancy of the mesentery and the cecum is loose, and uh, it's a non-obstructing condition and an incidental finding so uh, not something to be confused with a, a cecal volvulus. So in the cecal bascule, you will not see a beak sign. Uh, you will not see a transition. You will just see an abnormally located cecum. Here's another quiz question. A patient presenting with periumbilical pain and vomiting. Anyone care to hazard a guess? So we find that there is dilated small bowel. Excellent, Dr. Gagipa has given us the diagnosis, which is gallstone ileus. We have a dilated small bowel loop here, indicating small bowel obstruction. We have an abnormally thick-walled and contracted gallbladder. We have air in the biliary system, and we have a gallstone in the distal ileum, typical <laughs> laminated appearance, obstructing the distal small bowel and resulting in excuse me, small bowel obstruction. Another example in this case is a large amount of air within the gallbladder as a result of formation of a fistula between the <clears throat> biliary system and the, <clears throat> um, the, um, the intestine. 
and the the communication between the biliary system and the small bowel can occur at various levels. <clears throat> Here's a diagram of all the levels at which it can occur. Uh, in the majority of patients, the gallstone will actually pass through the entire bowel without obstruction. But if the stone is large, more than 2.5 centimeters in size, then it will typically obstruct the bowel. And the point of obstruction is the narrowest point of the ileum, which is about two feet from the ileocecal valve. But it may also obstruct the duodenum or the colon. There is a particular entity where the fistula occurs between the, uh, the gallbladder and the second portion of the duodenum and the gallstone becomes impacted here and there is a name for this condition where the gastric outlet obstruction occurs as a result of a gallstone and that entity is called Bouveret syndrome, a large gallstone that has migrated from the gallbladder into the duodenum and obstructs the duodenum as a result. Um, I think we'll stop here for now. We've got uh, we've uh, crossed half an hour, and uh, I think attention spans tend to flag. So we will cover the next portion of this topic on a subsequent occasion. Uh, there is uh, quite a lot to be discussed. Uh, I think we've had enough for today. Uh, so um, I would like to thank you all for your attention.